All right, well, welcome back. Um, my name is Noel Zainer Carmichael, professor in the Classics Department. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you our second speaker of today, Dr. Arm Park. Professor Park earned her BA in Greek at Yale University and her PhD at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her previous academic positions have been quite geographical, uh, geographically diverse, including Amherst College, University of Oklahoma, Washington and Lee University, and Brigham Young. Uh, she's currently assistant professor of classics at the University of Arizona. Dr. Park's research interests and scholarly activities are equally wide ranging. Her peer reviewed articles span multiple time periods, authors, and literary genres, including Hesiod, Ovid, and Longus. Her first book, an edited volume entitled Resemblance and Reality in Greek Thought, which was published in 2017 by Rutledge, examines Greek authors' self-consciousness in the dissonance between social, cultural, and historical reality and the literary works uh, that are produced from and reflect these contexts. She's currently finishing a book on the concepts of truth, gender, and genre in Pindar and Aeschylus. In addition, Dr. Park has recently turned her attention to outreach and advocacy. Um, she, for the Society for Classical Studies blog, she's written about pedagogy and about diversity and equity in classics. And she's currently working with the University of Arizona Center for Digital Humanities to visualize data on race and classics. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Aram Park, another one of our radical academics or academic radicals. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you all for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Can, is this all right or is it too echoey? Or? All right, so, um, so I'm going to talk today about multicultural voices in classical scholarship. And what I want to do is draw attention to voices in classical interpretation that deserve to be heard and amplified, not only because they come from marginalized voices in classics, but because these voices have expressed crucial and transformational insights about the material we study as classicists. And we have an intellectual and ethical responsibility to listen to and heed these voices. So there are three very broad areas that I'd like to cover. Um, translation of ancient texts, adaptations or receptions of ancient texts, and the history of classics as a discipline. And obviously, I, this should be obvious, but I'll say from the get-go that this is not going to be the exhaustive account of multi multicultural voices in classics. It is just a sampling. Um, and a lamentably small sampling, but one suggestive of the vast possibilities that lie in store for classics if we truly diversify the discipline. So first, translation. Um, a bit less than two years ago, Dr. Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey was published. It was widely heralded, heralded as the first English language translation of the Odyssey by a woman, and it was hailed for its new and provocative interpretive insights credited in large part to the female gender of its translator. I'll present just one example here as a way of sort of opening this talk. Um, it comes from book 22, after Odysseus has returned, he's joined forces with his son, and they have, together they have slaughtered the suitors that ta have taken up residence in Odysseus's home. Now they're determining the fate of the handmaids who had been loyal to those suitors. This is a really gut-wrenching and unsettling moment of the Odyssey. Odysseus and his son ultimately decide that these handmaids and really they are enslaved women, as Dr. Wilson points out, that they must die for aiding and abetting the suitors who have tried to take over Odysseus's home, even though these women themselves do not have much choice in the matter. And according to the translation of Robert Fagels, Telemachus declares when he's, you know, um, <laughs> declaring they should die, no clean death for the likes of them by God, not from me, they showered abuse on my head, my mother's too, you sluts, the suitors whores. 
Note that Fagel's translation, which is typical, has Telemachus denigrating these enslaved women with misogynistic name calling. But these terms are not in the original Greek, as I learned from reading about Dr. Wilson's translation in the New York Times. As she put it, quote, the original Greek is just a feminine definite article meaning female ones. To call them whores and sluts reflects a, quote, misogynistic agenda, end quote. So how does Dr. Wilson fix this mistranslation? I refuse to grant these girls a clean death since they poured down shame on me and mother when they lay beside the suitors. And I've put that side by side with the Fagel's translation that we saw before. The point I want to highlight is how, by Dr. Wilson's own acknowledgement, her female gender has informed her scholarly insights and interpretations. And I should also say the male gender <laughs> has informed the scholarly insights and interpretations or misinterpretations of previous translations. So what this example suggests is how the personal and individual identities and experiences that we bring to our study can inform and influence and shape our scholarship. The basic argument I am making should be obvious. When we call for diversity in classics, this is not just about magnanimously increasing access to the world of Greco-Roman antiquity, though of course we should do that, uh, and we have an ethical obligation to. It is also about understanding antiquity better. Indeed, even correcting misunderstandings, sometimes long-standing ones about antiquity, as Dr. Wilson does with her translation here. She had found that the vast majority of past English language translations all by men had perpetuated a misogynistic agenda. So for now, I want to turn to um, another item of translation, the in-progress translation work of Dr. <laughs> Stephanie McCarter, who is a classicist who has similarly found mis misogynistic mistranslations of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Almost all published English language translations of the Metamorphoses are by men, and it shows. A key example Dr. McCarter highlights comes from the myth of Leucothoe, a young woman who, thanks to the bewitching work of the goddess Venus, has unwillingly captured the attentions of the sun god. When he finally gets tired of merely looking at her, he rapes her. The Latin text is clear that this is not a consensual encounter, but Previous translators have not rendered it so clearly, and here's what one translator says for that episode. <laughs> she, Lakothoe, was frightened, let fall the spindle and the distaff, but even her fright was most becoming. He delayed no longer, turned to his true appearance, the bright splendor, and she, still fearful of the sudden vision, won over by that shining, took his passion with no complaint. This is a translation from the mid-20th century, a translation that was hailed by one, in, one reviewer as, quote, a work of the highest quality, which provides pleasure and information in generous measure, end quote. And another reviewer called it a translation that would, quote, quick, quickly establish itself as the translation for English-speaking readers and students of this great Augustan epic, end quote. But there are significant problems with this translation, as I learned from reading what Dr. McCarter had to say about it. Um, let's look at, look at the actual Latin for those words. Um, the actual Latin, uh, I've uh, italicized the problematic words that Dr. McCarter brought to my attention. What Humphreys translates as one over is the word wicta, um, which comes from a Latin word that denotes do domination, not persuasion. It is the same verb that Julius Caesar famously uses when he describes a recent military conquest. Wenny, weedy, weeky, I came, I saw, I conquered. And the word whim, which Humphreys translates as passion, actually refers to force. Passa est comes from a verb that means suffer or endure, and as Dr. McCarter points out, can connote experiencing sexual penetration. As she writes, Quote, Passa est more explicitly suggests suffering something deeply unpleasant, which makes Humphreys took feel off the mark. This is, after all, the word that gives us passion, 
not only the erotic passion of lovers, but the bodily passion, the suffering of Christ or his martyrs, end quote. In Dr. McCarter's translation, the sense of violence and violation becomes more vivid. She quakes and in her fright, distaff and spindle fell from fingers slackened. Dread made her lovely. He delayed no more, returned to his true form and normal brightness. But though the virgin feared the sudden vision, defeated by the brightness of the God, she quit her protest and endured his force. You can see how Dr. McCarter's translation brings out the ideas of violence and submission more accurately than the previous one. And I should also say that the previous translation is not atypical. The translators who came before Dr. McCarter tend to treat this, this rape as an ultimately consensual encounter. And I'll show you the key lines again, just side by side so you can really compare. The Latin is at the top. Um, and, uh, and I'll ask, what is it that brought Dr. McCarter the insights her male predecessors lacked? And I want to say it comes down to her female gender, but of course she put it in a much richer and more nuanced way than that. I reached out to her about the process of translation and the identity of the translator, and this is what she had to say, and it's a fairly long quote, so I will read it all, but uh, I, I don't want to miss channel these words and misrepresent them as mine, my own. They are her words. So, quote, I don't believe that translators who have eroticized Ovid's rape scenes have taken into account the full complexity of who the reader may be. The assumption is far too often that the reader is male and heterosexual, and the choices made are for that presumed reader. But what of the reader who is herself or himself a victim of sexual assault, or of the queer reader who will not see through this same lens? prioritizing other responses and questions, what is consent, what abuses of power are at work, how does disempowerment unfold, engages a broader range of readers and I believe can promote diversity within the field. One key example comes in the Lakothui episode. So many translators and scholars, I might add, interpret the rape there through the word nitor, which is this word here, nitore, right? Um, they, which means brightness or beauty, and they start with the premise that the sun is beautiful and then interpret Lakothoe's silence as indicative of consent. He's just too handsome, she's won over. But someone trained in gender theory whose interests in that field are influenced by her identity as a woman will perhaps start the other way around. Lukothoe's silence is indicative of non-consent, and so his beautiful gleam must be explained differently as terrifying rather than seductive. The, startling, the starting points, the questions, and the explanations are just different for the two interpreters, and the result, a full accounting of how the rape unfolds, speaks to more readers than a rendering that is disturbingly and off-puttingly romanticized. And I should, so that's the end of um, what Dr. McCarter says, and I'll use that to transition to uh, my next example I want to look at, which uh, my co-presenter, Dr. Kennedy, also mentioned it herself, although not this particular passage, but um, these kinds of corrective um, and revealing insights don't stem just from female gender alone. Dr. Shelley Haley, a classics professor at Hamilton College, who is herself African-American, has similarly, similarly investigated the texts of the classical world through the lens of critical race theory. And what she has found in the scholarship and interpretations of race in the ancient Mediterranean informed by her own self-professed black feminist leanings is startlingly revealing of the biases of modern classicists. As I turn to her work, I should say that it is not just about translation. It rather, it is about how we can use critical race theory to inform our understanding of constructed difference in the Roman world in the era of Augustus. And one of the things that becomes clear in this work is how Dr. Haley's position, positionality as a black feminist scholar has revealed the faults of previous translations and scholarship, not just by white scholars, but indeed by black male scholars. I'll hold up the example of her work on an Augustan era poem called the Moretum, which has been attributed to Virgil, the poet of the Aeneid. Probably it's not actually by Virgil, but um, it describes the evening meal preparation of a farmer nam named Similis, hence the title Moretum, which is a kind of pesto made from cheese, herbs, and garlic. 
Incidentally, it's from this poem that we get the phrase a pluribus unum out of meaning one. <laughs> but that's kind of a side point. Anyway, um, this text receives attention from scholars of classical antiquity because it describes a black female character. At one point, Simulus calls on Skibali, an African woman, to help him. And I'll show you the, the translated passage um, that describes this African woman. Uh, in Dr. Haley's translation, she was his only companion. Canyon, African in her race, her whole form a testimony to her country, her hair twisted into dreads, her lips full, her color dark, her chest broad, her breast flat, her stomach flat and firm, her legs slender, her feet broad and ample. Um, the moray term did not used to get that much attention among classicists, um, and when it was mentioned, it was usually within um, brief descriptions in handbooks about classical literature. And these handbooks, when they describe this text, re reflect everything from dismissive stereotyping to blatant anti-blackness among white scholars. They describe Skibbly as an old, an uh, ugly old negress who is Similis' housekeeper, or simply an old negress or old negress servant. Um, but as Dr. Haley points out, there is actually nothing in the poem that indicates Skibbly is either old or ugly. <laughs> Further, there is no indication that she's a slave or a servant, which is another scholarly assumption <laughs> about her. Um, the ways this passage has been translated, even by black classicists, reveals the influence about, of stereotypes about how black women look. For example, here are two translations by black male scholars of antiquity, including Frank Snowden from his influential 1970 book, Blacks in Antiquity, um, and the other is from a 1989 book, Romans and Blacks. Um, and I should say these are, you know, I don't want to criticize these books, but I'm just pointing out this one tiny thing in these books um, that, that is a little bit um, problematic. So Snowden's translation reads, African in her race, her whole figure, proof of her country, her hair tightly curled, lips thick, color dark, chest broad, breast pendulous, belly somewhat pinched, legs thin, and feet broad and ample. Thompson's reads, she was his only help. She was African in stock and all her physical features gave testimony to her land of origin. Tightly curled hair, swollen lips, dusky complexion, broad chest with low swinging breasts, belly rather pinched, thin legs, broad and ample feet. And what I've italicized in these um, translations are the phrases uh, that Dr. Haley identifies as problematic. So let me highlight them here. I've put on at the top, Yakane's mommies, the, um, the Latin phrase that these, um, uh, the translators translate. Uh, it literally translates lying, like lying down supine, with respect to her breasts, which is kind of hard to decipher admittedly, right? Um, <laughs> but it becomes, it comes morph, it morphs into hanging breasts by the mechanism, uh, mechanism of this sort of fixation on large breasts and stereotypes about black women's physiques. Dr. Haley's translation by contrast just says her breasts flat. Uh, what she has pointed out is that these, is that these translations reveal modern biases uh, more than anything else. As she puts it, the treatment of Skibbly reflects, quote, modern stereotypes intruding upon the analysis of ancient women, end quote. And I would add that it takes a black feminist classicist to identify these misinterpretations and to do Skibbly justice. And by extension, Dr. Haley does justice to our understanding of race in the ancient Mediterranean. What I've pointed out so far is how modern prejudices and pre pre preconceptions in the hands of male and especially white male pr practitioners of classics can distort our understanding and analysis of antiquity. But I've also optimistically started to touch on how modern perspectives by women or people of color or both can actually be illuminators of truth rather than distorters of it. This brings me to a comment made by Dr. Donnell pa Padilla Peralta, a black professor at Princeton University. We have already heard about the um, racist incident uh, at the Society for Classical Studies. Um, in a reflection on the incident afterwards, Dr. Padilla Peralta wrote explicitly about how his Afro-Latinity has shaped his scholarly insights for the better. He wrote, I quote, I should have been hired because I was black, because my black being in the world makes it possible for me to ask new and different questions within the field, to inhabit new and different approaches to answering them, 
to, uh, to, and to forge alliances with other scholars past and present whose black being in the world has cleared the way for my leap into the breach, end quote. I would like this talk to be demonstrative of what Dr. Padilla Peralta claims, that one's personal identity and experiences shape their interpretations and their acquisition of knowledge. And when it comes to traditionally marginalized voices in classics, this results in insights that are unprecedented and in many cases corrected. Indeed, the example I pointed out from Dr. Haley's work bears out the truth of these words by Dr. Padilla Peralta. So I'll turn now to adaptation and reception and what new light adaptations and studies of them, like reception studies, right, by underrepresented voices can reveal. Such innovations are startlingly illuminating, illuminating and if not corrective, then at the very least they shine light on what we failed to notice or didn't notice adequately before. At the meeting of the Society for Classical Studies, I attended a presentation by Professor Luis Alfaro, who is an award-winning Chicano playwright and professor in the University of Southern California's School of Dramatic Arts. Among other things, he has written a number of adaptations of Greek tragedies that have been staged all over the country. My friend and colleague, Dr. Young Kim of the Onassis Foundation has written about Professor Alfaro's adaptations, quote, in essence, Luis reimagines Greek tragedies and situates them in contemporary, gritty, urban settings, especially East Los Angeles, populated by characters inspired by his Chicano upbringing. As classicists, we know well the themes of the original plays, fate and choice, justice, violence and revenge, the marginalization of the other, and Luis incisively works with these in his own interpretations breathing intertextual life into the ancient as he offers his own vision of the dramas in the present, exploring sexuality, gender, queerness, race and racism, immigration, gang culture, religion and ritual, and ultimately love, end quote. I have never had the good fortune of seeing any of Professor Alfaro's plays performed, but I can tell you that just from his brief presentation at the Society for Classical Studies meeting and I was sitting next to uh, Professor Flores um, while there. Maybe you can correct me if I misrepresent anything. But it struck me that his work, that Professor Alfaro's work, doesn't just borrow material from the Greeks and reshape it for modern audiences. In instead, by resetting the ancient myths in modern, recognizable settings, he is shedding new light on the Greek past. By focusing on Oedipus as a love story, for example, which is not... Um, how I typically think of Oedipus, let's just put it that way. Um, but, uh, but by looking at it that way, by presenting it that way, I think he does bring out some of the complexities that are already in the play, but buried within the incense and revelation, incense, <laughs> incest, <laughs> buried within the incest and revelation motifs that we tend to focus on when we read Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, right? His retelling of Medea as an immigration story, too, illuminates the conflict between Jason and Medea and puts its source in the status of Medea as an outsider. And I sat in on, was, is it Classics 203 today, and saw that you all have already been talking about Medea as an immigrant, and Professor Kennedy has written also about Medea as an immigrant. So um, all, I think all of these just kind of wonderfully come together as the way of understanding Medea and the text better. Um, what might we imagine that these adaptations tell us? They highlight the preoccupations and fault lines in our own society, that is for certain. But they also shine a light back on antiquity, bringing out things that were in the text all along, but that previous interpreters maybe didn't foreground or maybe you know, in some cases intentionally ignored. People in this room accept it, obviously. <laughs> and in shining such light, illuminating both our present and the ancient past, these kinds of adaptations have the potential of bringing past and present together. Uncovering these truths, understanding the relationship between the present and the classical past, and what new things we can learn about both the past and present through examination of the relationship between them, this is, as I see it, the work we classicists should be doing. I recently learned of a similar kind of adaptive bridging of past and present that occurred on the South Korean stage. 
uh, as I was doing research for this talk, I came across a piece by Ms. Yunjung Huang, who comes to this material from a theater studies background rather than from a quote unquote traditional classics one. And she describes the current popularity in this essay, she describes the current popularity Greek studies is enjoying in Korea that this 2005 staging of Agamemnon in Seoul uh, represents. What she describes of this production is interesting, to say the least. And again, I have not had the good fortune of seeing it with my own eyes. Um, but as she describes it, she, the 2005 production was not actually an exclusively Korean adaptation of Greek tragedy, per se, because the director, whose vision of Agamemnon was staged on, in Korea, he himself is Greek. His name is uh, Michael Marmarinos. Yet the actors were all Korean, and the play was translated into Korean in ways that reflect Korean language customs. So what we saw, what we see here then is this unique blending of ancient and modern Greek perspectives overlaid with contemporary Korean culture. The director made several interesting choices that diverged from the ancient Greek quote unquote original. For example, he required the audience to physically move, to physically move at different moments in the play in order to, deserve, to observe what's happening. And he had the actors in the chorus dress not uniformly, but in their own clothes, sometimes witnessing the events of the play in total silence. What results is this conflation of audience and actor, of individual and chorus, and of Korean and Greek. This production is a composite of multiple layers of interpretation, which we might be tempted to dismiss as the odd idiosyncrasies of a modernizing director. But this layering and blending does not actually obfuscate. Rather, they, it brings out the, the nuances and subtleties of the quote unquote original play. Ms. Huang points out that Mr. Marmarinus' direct, directorial choices result in an incorporation and foregrounding of Korean daily life in the performance of the play, infusing the material of ancient Greece with a distinctly Korean modernity. And it strikes me that his interpretive choices also contain some very accurate reflections or maybe refractions of the play itself, not just the modernity in which it was produced. By forging the chorus as uh, individuals dressed, <laughs> uh, dressed in their own clothing, uh, he, he does unite them, not by their visual conformity, but by their silence and weirdly by their individuality. Um, and in doing so, the director draws attention, in my mind anyway, the director draws attention to the chorus's function in Aeschylus' Agamemnon, in which the agency of the chorus, as with any Greek tragedy, is very difficult to pin down. At times, they seem to be active participants in the drama. At other times, they seem to be helpless to affect its course. Also, by in incorporating the audience into the play, he forges a sense of community among them and transforms them into actors, blurring the line between theatrical reality and daily life, as Ms. Huang points out. And I feel like, in a way, that sort of parallels what we know of ancient Greek tragedy um, in performance, which occurred in the open air to many, many people. You know, it must have been a sort of blending of, um, of, of different types of people, but also, you know, the actors and the um, audience are very close together, right, and all under the open sky. So anyway, uh, basically, imposing modernity and Koreanness on Agamemnon in some ways helps or can help refine our understanding of the quote unquote original ancient Greek play. By placing these various layers of interpretation on top of one another, the South Korean staging of a modern Greek director's Agamemnon does not obscure, rather it illuminates. Some of these choices parallel what Luis Alfaro does in his adaptations of Greek tragedy, using local actors, local customs, to bring specific communities to bear on the material from Greek antiquity, and thereby unearthing new insights about that material. Ms. Huang concludes with points about the universality of Greek theater and the minimization of difference between Greek and Korean. I would go further to say that in blending ancient Greek and modern Korean in this way, we don't just bring classics to a Korean audience, we also learn a lot more about the underlying me meanings and nuances of that Greek play. 
So I'll turn now to the work of another colleague and new friend, Dr. Rosa Andujar of uh, King's College London. She is a Dominican American, though she now also holds UK citizenship, citizenship and she identifies as Afro-Latina. And I asked her about how her background uh, intersects with her work in classics. In her own words, quote, my research is deeply informed by who I am and what I have experienced. My research can be described as falling into two distinct but complementary areas, ancient Greek tragedy, especially the tragic chorus, and Hellenic classicisms in Latin America. I began developing a new research strand in the reception of Greek drama in an unexplored context, Latin America and the Hispanic Caribbean, in addition to my continuing work on the tragic chorus. This was partly due to my Dominican American background. That is, I had a cultural interest in this region, the benefit of my training as a classical philologist and a scholar of Greek tragedy, as well as the um, language skills with which to pursue such a project. But equally important, it struck me that though reception had gone global, that is to say that scholars were starting to explore various non-Western and post-colonial contexts, much of this research, in my view, nevertheless followed old imperial and colonial frameworks, end quote. There are just a few things I want to point out about Dr. Andujar's um, excellent work. First, she once had the opportunity to perform in the chorus in a live production of a Greek tragedy, and which has, I think, <laughs> demonstrably informed her interest in the Greek chorus in her scholarship. Uh, she's completing a monograph on the Greek chorus and has co-edited a volume of essays on the Greek chorus, which was published last year by de Gruyter. Second, her interest in reception is informed in part by her experiences as a scholar in the UK, where essentially reception studies in classics was born, and in part by her non-UK origins, which has led her to explore reception in areas outside of the former British Empire. Much of British reception studies has focused on areas that were formerly part of that empire, but Dr. Andujar has turned to Latin America instead. This is not to say that she is quote unquote only interested in Latin America because she herself is Latina, nor is it to imply that Latin America itself is monolith, as she points out in her, book, in her work. I'm simply saying that Dr. Andujar's unique set of identities and experiences has influenced the direction of her scholarly inquiry and the types of scholarly questions she poses in her study of Greek texts, resulting in new and valuable scholarly insights. Her research in Latin American classical reception, numerous articles as well as a forthcoming edited volume, illuminates the com complicated relationship classics can have with modernity. Given the European origins of Greco-Roman study, classics in Latin America necessarily is entrenched in ideologies of colonialism, whether in the hands of the colonizers who brought classics to the Americas or in the hands of the colonized who deployed classics to counter their colonizers. For example, Greek liter literature was at times deployed in Latin America to create a sense of Latin America as distinct and independent from its Spanish colonial origins. Dr. Andujar has examined how Hellenism specifically, as opposed to, you know, study of Latin, uh, provided one avenue for Latin America to break from Catholic, that is to say Roman Catholic, Spain, through which much of classical antiquity was filtered. Her forthcoming edited volume uh, on ancient drama in Latin America interrogates a number of things, not least of which is how the revolutionary context of 19th century Latin America informed adaptations of Greek drama and what such adaptations can tell us not only about 19th century Latin America, but about the ideas inherent within the original texts themselves. In engaging with Latin American classical receptions, Dr. Andujar and her collaborators engage with, indeed confront, the turbulent and violent and disharmonious history in the creation of Latin America and the relationship of classics to such a history. Their volume focuses on drama for a number of reasons, one of which is that the European colonizers recognized the potential for drama with its in intrinsically public nature as a performance genre to educate, or indoctrinate the masses. <laughs> Appropriations of classics in Latin America can be uh, representational or oppositional. So complex is the fraught relationship between colonizer and colonized and in the texts that negotiate and refract this relationship. 
What is really significant to note here is how Dr. Anduhar and her colleagues have challenged dominant paradigms of Latin America and of reception studies using classics to inform understandings of Latin America, but also using interrogation of classical Latin America to shed new light on classics. Given that such work requires deep knowledge of the source texts in order to understand uh, their inter iterations and afterlife in the complex nexus that is Latin America. Interrogating what is colonial and what is post-colonial and how classic surfaces in both, indeed forming an intersection between the two. In that vein, she and her colleague, Justine McConnell, have started a new book series, Classics in the Post-Colonial, to explore these topics further. What I, as a classicist and a person of color, find striking and valuable about such work is how it explores new ways of thinking about classics itself and what its purpose is. Dr. Anduhar and her colleagues ultimately explore the complexities not only of colonial and post-colonial frameworks, but also of classics itself, as it cannot even be used in these frameworks without itself inheriting similar complexities. By trying to identify the role of classics in such a complicated region, Dr. Anduhar shines a light on classics and how its shape changes depending on who its practitioners are. We have inherited, or maybe have had imposed on us, an idea of classics as um, some of us, I should say, have inherited and had imposed on us, an idea of classics as the neutral study of Greco-Roman antiquity. But Greco-Roman antiquity is itself a construct, and its neutrality is a mirage. When we see how classical texts can represent certain agendas, it is incumbent on us to examine what our own agenda is in studying classics and what assumptions we start with, what assumptions we should reject, etc. So I'm turning to my final section, uh, history, and to one of many scholars in classics who has shed light on its history. Um, I should say that this, you know, division between reception and adaptation and history is kind of a false division. Uh, reception and history are intricately intertwined, and the work I'm turning to kind of overlaps with the work that Dr. Anduhar is doing, but um, I just wanted a third bullet point, I guess. Um, it, <laughs> I also was <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but it's also at least confined to a particular time frame of history in a fairly contained region. And what I'm talking about specifically is uh, the work of one of my old professors, Dr. Feroz Basunia, who's originally from India and is now a classicist in the UK, and I'm told comprises one third of the classicists of color in the UK. Um, <laughs> his research range is large, but one work I want to look at is his 2013 book, The Classics and Colonial India. One of the many things he point out, points out in this book is that ancient Greece and Rome, like the India colonized by Europeans, is a product of cultural imagination. Our understanding of Greco-Roman antiquity is inevitably filtered through a perspective that Greco-Roman antiquity is a thing, <laughs> it's a thing to understand, as opposed to just, I don't know, Mediterranean antiquity as a whole or wherever we want to set these boundaries. Um, British colonialism in South Asia meant the introduction of a vision of Greece and Rome as the colonizers imagined them to the region as the colonizers identified with the Greco-Roman classics. But of course, it's not that simple. Like Dr. Anduhar, Dr. Basunia exposes the complexities of co colonialism and classics here specifically in a region, India, that had its own views of antiquity and of Greece and Rome. The ancestors of the colonized in India had had their own ancient contact with Greece and Rome and had their own views of antiquity alongside those of the British colonizers, sometimes dovetailing at other times diverging. And so, of course, the reception of classics in colonial India is very, very complex and not as simple as aligning the British Empire with the Roman or asserting that the colonized in India had no care for Greco-Roman antiquity. In Dr. Fizunia's own words, quote, another way to put this would be to say that from the 18th to the 20th centuries, the reception of Greco-Roman antiquity was conservative and revolutionary, sterile and fecund, dis disciplined and unfettered, celebratory and self-critical, end quote. The thing is, India was somewhat unique among the colonized subjects of Britain in that it had, it had its own literary traditions, uh, that the ancient literary traditions that the British respected as on par with and as old as Greco-Roman antiquity. 
and they didn't have this kind of respect for the traditions of other places they colonized. As Dr. Vasunia points out, both the British colonizers and the people of India they colonized looked to the classical past for justification and authority for their causes, which in the context of that particular region amounted to using classics as a way of rejecting the Mughal Empire and its traditions. The British looked to the Roman Empire as a counterexample for Mughal imperial mismanagement. Indians looked to the glory days of classical Sanskrit as a way of rejecting Muslim traditions. It occurs to me that when we note this double and complementary use of classical antiquity by colonizer and colonized alike, we not only identify multiple perspectives on antiquity, but we can view antiquity through these many perspectives and thereby understand antiquity in new ways. Viewing antiquity through the lens of how it's been used in imperial contexts shows us both something about the modern empire and about the ancient empires and peoples to which the moderns looked for answers. So I'm going to conclude um, with really just like a series of questions. Um, I'm getting very short shrift to these scholars' works, uh, but I hope I have given a taste of the enrichment of knowledge that occurs when we have a diversity of perspectives and voices. These various excursions into the classical past that I've indulged in um, and blended with the present of these various places, this, this, all of this is a way of revivifying classics, making it come alive. This is helpful to classical scholars, of course. We are always looking for new ideas to research, some of us because we need tenure or promotion. Um, uh, but it is also a way for classics to preserve itself. My friend Young Kim has said more than once, based on his own experiences at a department of classics that was essentially forced out of existence, that he views diversity both among its practitioners and in our, way, our avenues to antiquity as the only way for classics to survive, and I agree. But is that really all to be gained from diversity? The preservation of a discipline that was pretty much started by white people for white people, um, Dr. Padilla Peralta has argued that diversity is not about, quote, bringing new folks to old stuff, end quote, or about immortalizing classics um, through the bodies of people of color in this sort of, you know, very scary get out style like <laughs> immortalization, nor is it solely about viewing ourselves through the eyes of the other, rather it is about a revolution in human value and a quote unquote, transformative act that necessitates a change in the language we use towards each other. What he is suggesting, I think, and what I agree with, is a change or expansion of what we view as classics. Dr. Kim made a similar point when he wrote about Luis Alfaro's presentation at the SCS meeting. Professor Alfaro, an award-winning playwright and professor, is not a trained classicist per se. He has not read the Greek tragedies in their original language, but what he has done is understand them a certain way and present the same stories in adaptations that shed new light on those original stories and ultimately help us understand them better. The same could be said for the other thinkers I have profiled here, Dr. Anduhar, Ms. Huang, Dr. Vasunia. These diverse thinkers show us the potential for classical material to, to thrive in perpetuity. And there are many, many others. Uh, the community of classes of color is a small but growing one. And I've not had the time to do justice to all of their work. Um, these thinkers also give occasion for classics as a field to reflect on itself. What is classics really? How was it born and how does it thrive? If it was born in a way that we no longer really can find acceptable, what parts can we salvage and how? We can't really truly begin to even begin to answer these questions without diversifying the field. The danger of not doing so, classics simply stagnates and exists only via replication. This is bad for the field, but it is also simply bad for knowledge and the truth. We will never truly understand Mediterranean antiquity if we don't cultivate and push for new eyes on it and hail these views, not just as sort of interesting, but perspectives, but as truths that shine light on things that we have never seen before. Thank you.
questions. And um, just a reminder, those of you who are joining in on Zoom, um, you can send in your questions. And um, we'll start here with anybody in the audience. Gwen? <laughs> I don't think you should apologize for that. <laughs> Um, so you sat in on my class earlier today, the classical mm -hmm. reception class, and I had made um, kind of a comment um, that I want to formally ask you after watching your presentation. Um, and what I had said in class is that sometimes um, there's this awkward, I guess, maybe moment when we're in class discussing these um, important and interesting articles um, where we refer to these authors by solely their last name, yeah. which I think is a good thing to some extent because you're giving these people on anonymity. Mm -hmm. um, and you're kind of leaving prejudice at the door to some extent. But at the same time, I said in class that sometimes I feel like I don't know who I'm reading and what habitus they bring to mm -hmm. the article. So I don't know if I'm reading the work of a man or a woman, or I don't know where in the world they come from. Mm -hmm. um, and you rightly point out in your presentation that, you know, people of color bring something really interesting to the table and these different perspectives are absolutely necessary. And so, mm -hmm. I'm curious what you have to say about whether or not we should emphasize in some capacity the maybe um, where they come from or... Yeah, I mean, um, some of this... Um, so, <laughs> how, can I, how can I start with this? Good. I, I was thinking of this when you asked it in class too. Um, yeah, in some ways this sort of neutralizing of scholarship is a way of protecting the people who wrote it, right? Um, but at the, uh, on the other hand, it can be seen as a form of erasure, right? Um, and so, um, and I think if we don't consciously think of um, who the scholar is, right, um, what results is erasure anyway, right? So there, I mean, I am guilty of this. There are many, many, pa I, I don't share them online for that reason, because I'm ashamed, but <laughs> there are many, many past syllabi of mine that, you know, all the readings are by like white men, right? Um, and it's only in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years that I've started to really start thinking about who I put on the syllabus, right? Um, uh, mostly I'm talking about secondary scholarship, right? So um, I guess in some ways, like we, we have to walk the, the fine line, right? Between um, figuring out how to um, protect a scholar, but also how to like lift them up, right? Um, I'll also say that a lot of this anonymity um, in the scholarship, the supposed anonymity in the scholarship like production process um, is somewhat uh, illusory because, uh, well, first of all, not everything is anonymous, right? So like if you write a book and you submit it, like a monograph, right? Um, the readers know who you are. They, it's not, you don't know who they are. Sometimes you can figure it out, but like th they know who you are. It's not like they try to figure. So already like there's one form, a huge form of scholarship that already is not like anonymous anyway, right? Um, and then um, sometimes you can kind of just tell <laughs> whether, um, for example, I mean, you probably can't, well, you can often tell or have a very good idea of like the gender of a scholar, right? Um, and I, I will say that uh, there's one article I published on like uh, asexual reproduction in Hesiod's Theogony. Um, I had a hard time getting it published, you know, uh, and it was blind peer reviewed, right? But um, nobody really liked, I mean, I'm not saying it was like an awesome article. I'm just saying nobody really liked it, right? And one of the criticisms, I, it is published now, but like not in a classics journal. One of the criticisms that one of the reviewers wrote was like, I get the sense that even though this author never uses the word feminist, that this is a feminist reading. And I think this author needs to just put that on the table right now. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but basically they were like saying, this author really should lay their cards out and like self-identify as a feminist if that's what you know <laughs> and so i so i ended up doing that just to get published but you know the default position is like not feminist right like if you're not feminist which is over like who isn't feminist that's a very problematic thing right but like if you're not feminist um like that's the acceptable default neutral mode, right? And nobody has to self-identify as that, right? So I don't know. Um, I, that's not really an answer to your question, but it is like sometimes this anonymity is just 
we, we don't really have that anonymity anyway, right? Um, so if we consciously do make the choice, let's put some more women on the syllabus, right? Or let's put some more people of color on the syllabus. You know, I, I mean, I think that's all to the good anyway, so. As we could know, yeah. I mean, some scholars um, do that um, in some way. I mean, it's not very, it's not really the norm in classics, but um, like, you know, Edward Said's Orientalism, right? Like in the introduction, he like tells us where he's from, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Well, I just wanted to add, um, you know, I can't remember if it was your talk or Rebecca, but if, if whiteness is the absence of color, mm -hmm. then knowledge becomes white by default mm -hmm. if we don't talk about where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is something that I think we, I actually, now that I have tenure and I have that safety, I actually <laughs> make a real point of talking about where I come from and what brought me into classics. Yeah. And I really try to foreground who I am because I think that helps dispel the illusion that we're actually unfortunately reinforced when we go to high school and college that we have to have this really neutral third mm -hmm. person objective yeah. truth as though that's ever even possible. Like it's yeah. not even possible to ever speak objectively. So I think we're doing the color of knowledge a disservice by yeah. failing to acknowledge that. Yeah. And I just want to add to that as well because um, I tell my students every day I get history majors and they're like, oh, I have to use the third person. I was like, no, just say I. Are you the person yeah. who thinks this? Are you the person who's arguing this? Are you the person who is interpreting this? My modern US history colleagues insist on trying to pretend that you can reach some sort of objective mode mm -hmm. where the facts, like there's still this strand of positivism um, in mm -hmm. many history departments that, that, that I, ha I, I can't, I, I just can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to leave it as it is. Um, because I think we all do bring something different to the table. I mean, why do I write a book about immigrant women? Because half my family is immigrated from Japan and half of my family is Eastern European immigrants, right? And so this is what I'm interested in, right? We all have to sort of, it, I think it's better for us if we front that. And when I put people on my syllabus, I put their full name on my syllabus so my students know exactly who they are. And I tell them right up front in my syllabus, I am making sure that you guys have a diversity of ranges of voices on the syllabus because that's the only way that you're actually going to understand and, and learn how to interpret and do the work. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry. so I want to kind of piggyback off of this. I, I think this is raising some really interesting, important questions about how we um, define scholarship and the scholar. Mm -hmm. um, all three of you are heavily invested and involved in um, what we have traditionally termed outreach, but as public um, mm -hmm spokespiece people for classics. Um, and so my question slash comment is, if we are going to have this transformation, this transformative act, then it seems to me that it also has to start at the institutional level mm -hmm. and what is considered yeah. valued as scholarship. Yeah. And you, know, you mentioned translation which for so long yeah right has been disregarded as as scholarship um because it's been ignored as an interpretive act mm -hmm. um where the research and the interpretation is embedded within mm -hmm. the text right yeah. um or in footnotes and commentary um in the same vein blog posts mm -hmm. and all of the effort and work that is involved in developing new courses that are inclusive and celebrate multiculturalism, all of that legwork, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, which is so time oriented mm -hmm. and takes so much time. What is the value that, right. you know, yeah. we obviously value it, but at the institutional level and especially for non tenured yeah. faculty, um, right? This is, this is really problematic yeah. as I see. Oh, it, right? definitely. You know, whether or not blog posts can, can count as mm -hmm. scholarship. Yeah. Um, and my university, ha I'm not tenured yet, but my university um, has adopted language within its like tenure and promotion guidelines that um, stresses a quote unquote inclusive view of scholarship. So that 
they are at least, you know, paying lip service to the idea of like expanding what we think of as quote unquote scholarship, right? There is a problem though, like in the materials they send to external reviewers of tenure, <laughs> they fail to include this language. <laughs> but, but I think, uh, I think that that'll change soon enough. I, you know, it'll probably be sort of a top down, trickle down effect. Um, but yeah, so I think some institutions are starting maybe to um, move in baby steps towards a more inclusive view of scholarship. Um, traditionally, right, like book reviews and yeah. um, blog posts are seen as service. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. And not scholarship. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's really problematic. I'm including, uh, I did love my first book review, and I include everything I have printed publicly. Hmm? I'm going to print it all out and scan it all in and make a deal with it. Yeah. And then just see what happens. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I would I would add it's hard to overestimate the conservatism and inertia of mm -hmm. the people on the review boards of the mm -hmm. journals and yes. the people who are writing your external yeah. reviews. And I mean, I think this goes back to what this gentleman had said earlier, where I don't think there's a human. Um, you're not born with racism, but I think humans are taught to protect privilege and they're taught to protect yeah. their power. Mm -hmm. And so there's a hugely exclusionary force mm -hmm. that is trying to keep you from getting your book published with Cambridge because they yeah. want their publication to yeah. mean more. And yeah. so that's something that I think it, it, it's at all sides. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've talked to younger scholars and I'm, I'm really enjoying the chance to start building more of an individuated voice now mm -hmm. that I don't have to please the powers yeah. that be as mm -hmm. much. But it's really hard to be able to afford that. And I know that that's yeah. a privilege. Like and it's all the steps to get to take to get there right, yeah right so i mean it, it just I, i'm so glad that you're calling our attention to so many of the forms of productive output that are that are really changing what the field looks like and i'm hoping that some of us can can help the cause by valuing it and reviewing it and and you know giving right. our positive reviews when we can Oh, there's one of your quotes, I think the first one that shows clearly the, the mass socialism of whosoever that person was to such a way like the person was taking pleasure of making that woman suffer. One of those quotes you had up there? Oh, yeah, let's just look at that quote yeah. <laughs> so we can... Uh, uh, this one? No, uh, well, maybe. <laughs> but but, but you know, I wanted to make reference to this one. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's it. But, but anyway, in it, we, we saw that whosoever the actor was, mm -hmm. he, took, he took some kind of pleasure of making that woman scream, you know, suffer mm -hmm. whatever the case was. That's one. But on the other hand, earlier, Dr. Kennedy talked about how the, the talk about the homogeneous behavior of the Greek. Mm. The, uh, you, you, you follow? You following? <laughs> the homogeneous attitude uh -huh. of mm -hmm. the Greek, as we are men and you women, you just sit down somewhere. Oh, I see. From Bernard Knox, yeah. Yeah. So now my 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 question would be. When I'm making it a twist, mm -hmm. when when Paul, the Apostle Paul, went to Greek, calling himself, he went to convert, mm -hmm. quote unquote, the, the, the Greek to Christianity. So now, when one when we follow the attitude of the Greek and all the things that were going on, especially in Corinth, mm -hmm. you know, to the point that today we will have those what we call them those those big stuff they put on, on, on the churches, those, the long, huh? the steeple, mm -hmm. which at that time was found on the top of the whole house, what we could call. That was really the, it, they said I think it was a form of a penis that was stick, <laughs> I, I mean, on the whole house. So today, unfortunately, the churches put, put it as a symbol of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making, we also found out that how Paul, especially him, mm -hmm. has put so much emphasis on anti-feminist. He's really, you know, 
in many ways, he showed that, you know, he's not, he was not a feminist. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So how, at what level you think that the I Greek have influenced yeah. Christianity at that level or to the point where this kind of attitude becomes of what Dr. Kennedy called a white Christian elite phen phenomenon, mm -hmm. talking about racism. So now my question, it seems that the same racism attitude that could become a white Christian elite affair, at what time feminism and anti-feminism would become a white Christian elite thing? The way it seems that the Greek have influenced Christianity in terms of its behavior is, is, is homogeneous attitude. Or would we still keep on believing that the woman should not be speaking in church or whatever else that is out there would be a divine, a divine mm -hmm. saying of some of God that existed for from the beginning? Yeah. I really don't, I don't know, actually. Um, do you, does anybody want to jump in or? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Should I bring you a mic? <laughs> I mean, I think, so, so there's a couple of things. Um, one, I think, you know, Paul is functioning in, 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 a, in what is almost a thoroughly Greek world um, at that point um, and a Roman world and of course, um, the misogyny and the situating of women within Greek culture and uh, generally sort of speaking, but because you also have Judaism, right? So you have Judaism, you have, um, you have Eastern Greek, sort of uh, Greek, East, Middle Eastern Greek uh, behaviors, and then you have Roman overlay on top because um, these are all different sort of intersections of what's happening in the early Christian world. Um, we do, you know, have lots of evidence that many of the earliest Christians are in fact women. Um, they were deacons in the churches and these sorts of things. Um, and it's really that um, post sort of in that second century where we start seeing uh, that move away and we start seeing them be erased from the text as the canon is being formed. Um, but I actually was reading something um, that suggested that the great movement that led to the sort of suppression of women's voices in Christianity was the, um, the, the um, attempts to squash martyrdom. Hmm. Martyrdom. So the, 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 what we start seeing in sort of the second century and third century CE is high levels of, not high levels, but, but more than, than one would expect of, of people who are embracing Christianity, who are uh, certain that the second coming is coming quickly. Um, they are waiting for it. Um, and so they are rejecting um, sacrificing to the imperial cult and other things. And they are choosing instead, um, really as a sort of political act in some ways, to, um, to, to send themselves to their deaths. And this is actually really frustrating to um, many people who are trying to create a church hierarchy at this time. And it happens that many of these people who are sending themselves to martyrdom are women. Mm. Um, and so one of my colleagues actually suggested that um, Constantine's calling of the Council of Nicaea and his making Christianity legal was an attempt to stem the flow of martyrdom and to put an end to it as a, a force within um, mm -hmm. the church. Um, so you, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on. It's not just Paul being embedded in the Greek context uh, because Paul is also fairly um, anti-gay and this is not something that he would have gotten from an Athenian context or from any other types of Greek contexts. Um, so, so he's imbibing lots of different things, but he would have gotten that, maybe picked that up from the Romans a bit, um, as it were. So there's, there's a lot of different things in play, but I think there's a politics of it as well to sort of suppress the voices of women intentionally that is both Greek, Roman, also Judaic, and something uniquely political to the moment of how Christianity is developing in the empire. So that's what I would say about that. Can everybody hear me? All right, this question is for Dr. Kennedy and it is from Dr. Mary Gilbert in Birmingham Southern College. She says, hi, Rebecca, thanks so much for your talk. Am I right to understand? Hello. 
<laughs> Am I right to understand that you were more focused on the Western part of Western civilization than the civilization part of it? <laughs> no, you... I just like civilization too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it keeps going. Do you have anything to add about the positive or negative connotations of the word civilization? Should we keep it and talk about ancient civilizations or should we drop it too? I think we should drop civilization <laughs> too. Um, and the reason is, so actually Katrin Bluen, um, who writes for the blog uh, Everyday Orientalism, she has a really wonderful piece on there about the problem of the term civilization. The term civilization is an inherently ranking term. It's about ranking and hierarchies. And it's about putting civilizations or putting peoples or cultures or whatever you want to call them um, in competition with each other. And so I actually say, get rid of it. Some people use culture instead and, and they like to think that that's somehow also a neutral word. But if you actually look at the way culture is used, some people are actually using it um, to pretend they're not talking about race, um, which is also problematic. So maybe we have to make up new words. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm not, what did you say? Yes, we're talking about complex yeah. systems and okay. trying to reduce them to something that you can put in competition with each other and rank and make hierarchies of them. I think you just do away with the whole thing, blow it up and start over. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, Kwame Apaya uses peoples. Um, that's sort of oh, his yeah, way okay. of getting out of it. He says, we're going to talk about peoples. Um, and I'm going to use that term loosely, he says. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I just kind of want to bring back a little bit to uh, the discussion about uh, blogs and postings and, and outreach and those types of things as regards to, you know, what we do as professionals um, in terms of, you know, tenure and promotion. You ever mentioned those buzzwords at the chair, all of a sudden gets very nervous, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and in, in some ways, I, you know, I agree completely in terms of the need for outreach actives and, and engagement with uh, communities that we don't normally see as things that we're supposed to be engaging with. Mm -hmm. um, um, for me, it's always a matter of where you, you know, where you put it in the box, you know, because we're, yeah. we're administrators like to put things in boxes yeah. and such. Uh, so um, before people start screaming at the Twitters or things like this, like, oh my goodness, they're th talking about blog posts as being part of research, I think one of the things I want to emphasize is what, what at least I'm wanting to talk about or wanting to say is it's a, so this isn't a question, I think it's a comment. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I hate it. I, I hate it when people do that. But, um, but thinking about the, uh, the role of the modern academic um, is not only to push the bounds of human knowledge forward, but it's also take people with you as you go into that journey and to develop that, that community of scholars. Mm -hmm. And that is not just publishing to the American Journal of Philology or uh, Antiquity, mm -hmm. uh, but that, that requires a lot of different things. And over the time, over time, we have adjusted what we've seen as scholarship and what we've seen as outreach. The mm -hmm. AIA just put forth um, a den to their um, um, you know, statements on, on you know, how to engage or how to treat electronic uh, research or electronic work and, and broadening out those types of, of uh, considerations as the technology has our open access, these types of issues. So I think it, it goes towards this idea of uh, that I hear hints around of we've got to change our attitudes in terms of who we are and what we do and who is and who we're interacting and engaging with. And it's not just each other. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah, everybody. I think what you're what you're saying is like we need to think about who classics is for. Is it just for other classicists, right? Bingo. Which is sort of the traditional view of peer reviewed scholarship, right? Or is it um, is it for like produ producing and disseminating knowledge like more widely, right? So. Uh, I would also add one other thing too is that I actually so I was uh, when I was at this conference um, last week in Newcastle it was on authority and creating 
contemporary narratives of classics. And one of the um, speakers was talking about postgraduate um, blogging. So blogging that sort of bridges that gap between the sort of, um, you know, just kids goofing around on Tumblr and experts who have blogs. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that she uh, mentioned was that, um, that many faculty blogs are actually ruminations on academia itself, which is, you know, kind of <laughs> isolating and it's not really interesting to, to the outsider yeah. who doesn't really care, like, you know, whether, um, you know, we need three articles for tenure plus a book or, <laughs> you know, or whatever, yeah. or, or the, or, and they don't actually, frankly, um, care about what is probably, I think, the most pressing, one of the most pressing issues on academia today, which is the adjunctification of the mm -hmm. workforce, yeah. right? Um, but this is sort of like where I sort of think about um, like Katrin's um, and Osama um, Ali God's blog, which is the everyday Orientalism or my own blog, where we actually do, it's like preliminary versions of our research mm -hmm. or yeah. things that our research has inspired us to think about. Um, because I actually think of my blog, I mean, the first place we do outreaches to our students in the classroom. Yeah. And if anything, I would treat my blog more as a teaching tool. Um, than it is scholarship, but it, that's because I also go to, I teach at a university where this idea of this, the teacher scholar is, is valued and is emphasized. Yeah. Um, that we're, are, we're supposed, you know, we had a, a workshop some years ago called the synergy, of course, you know, it's such a buzzword for admins, the synergy <laughs> between research and scholar, you know, research and teaching. Um, and some of us believe that this is actually a thing <laughs> that, that should yeah. exist in the world. Um, and so I think that there are actually places, if we think about what we're doing in our classroom and what we do as public facing scholars, as that public facing scholar is sort of a hybrid of what we already do. And, yeah. and it's, I don't think it's, it fits in service. I think it fits closer to teaching and research and mm -hmm. in that zone of, of thinking. Yeah. And maybe we sort of push for that because I think you know, as people as like us, as we get tenure, we're the people who have to make that push to recognize and value that work for younger scholars. Yeah. I would even say that divisions between teaching and research are like false. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like I have a hard time even, you know, filling in those parts of my academic review. <laughs> a collage. Or <laughs> Oh, partly because of those mention of those boxes for admin, it's difficult for people outside of our fields mm -hmm. to judge our work without yeah. the boxes. Mm -hmm. Have you guys started putting together any type of rubric for how admin could evaluate blog posts? Because yeah. not all of us post more than like a few lines and I yeah. wouldn't personally count that towards tenure, but I would count the kind of posts you guys are talking about. Yeah, I myself have not done this work, but have you, I mean, I know that there are people out there who are like sort of putting together uh, alternate sure paradigms. Yeah. Your own rubric. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, with teaching, with teaching part of your tenure.ca, you might say letters that you've got yeah. students where you made an impact on them. I, yeah. get, I get emails from people who said, I've never seen an Indian classicist before, and you've given me mm -hmm. a reason to feel like I need to continue. And so I wonder if we could save like evidence of, yeah, of making a connection with a human being, which after mm -hmm. all is what the humanities has. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I don't like include some of the emails. <laughs> <laughs> you made your own reading. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's interesting that the, the first thing we tried to do was to take the blog posts out of service mm -hmm, as yeah. if that's the redheaded stepchild of the three prongs of the academic mm -hmm. life. Well, I'm, but I'm, I'm just saying, it's like, it's very quick. It's a, I, I don't know about uh, people at other institutions, but it's research and it's yeah. teaching or it's teaching research. Mm -hmm. And then that third, that third thing, that service thing, is just like, oh, just list the things that you do. Yeah, I don't really need any discussion. I don't want to talk about it. Well, that's not the way it is here at the college. Aren't you good? You're glad you didn't get that job here. <laughs> so I guess I, I guess I would just say it just goes back to reconceptualizing and rebalancing some of the things that we're supposed to be doing as academics and as as members of the academy, not just members of 
you know, we're all smarty people, but actually people who have an impact upon, should have an impact on the rest of the world. I think you should Yeah. Okay. A couple of questions over here, so I'll shut up. I wanted to um, return maybe to the PowerPoint a little bit. Um, I'm very, very interested in the way that you talk about translation exercises because, as we've discussed, it is an extremely important aspect to classes, classicists and classical studies, um, especially to make it accessible to non-classicists, which I think is really important. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the way that you talked about this this exercise of like new versus old translations really made it seem like there's a call to action here where we have a responsibility to amend these old translations that purport these ideologies that are not important to us anymore, um, such as racist, sexist, whatever um, ideologies, and to also lift the veil of whitewashing and mm -hmm. make it more realistic. And what I'm was curious um, what you had to say about is, um, do you think that we have a responsibility to completely rewrite these translations, such as with Emily Wilson, or do you want to do something more along the lines of your kind of study where we just publish articles pointing out these discrepancies and say, not to say that you're not a valuable mm -hmm. scholar and maybe you're a product of your time, but also um, examples such as this is evidence of the change in the discipline. Yeah, I don't know that we need to retranslate like every single text you know I don't I don't know whether every single text has been translated in a problematic way right um, so uh, but I think you know if somebody's working on a text and they notice something that's like wrong in a really like you know <laughs> ideological way or something yeah we do have a responsibility to call it out and I don't think it's an either or like we can retranslate texts right or we can do articles or both right to to show um the problems there yeah <laughs> i don't know <laughs> guys are talking all about these blog posts and things because um, I think that there is an opportunity there technologically for people to provide a forum in which we can discuss these kinds of problematic translations mm -hmm. where if we have one line of problematic text we don't need to necessarily rewrite the whole thing or write a harsh criticism right. article of this mm -hmm. person um, but we can have a forum in which we can say you know just so you guys know they're talking about rate, not abduction here, or, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. making these kinds of claims. Yeah, and like a lot of the times the, the do professor that. can do that, you know, and then without having to publish new translation or something, right? Like, yeah. but, yeah. But I think when it, right, it comes to, what's interesting about translation is that for a long time, that was the sort of soft yeah. area of, mm -hmm. of scholarship and of course, um, women were so important in the history of mm -hmm. classics in producing translation um, and male classicists wanted no part in it mm -hmm. um, because it was seen as sort of too soft. Right, um, yeah. Right, but I think your talk um, really highlights the importance of um, in that, so the moral imperative on mm -hmm. faculty members to choose their translations yeah. carefully mm -hmm. um, and to avoid these outdated translations that we often, not myself, but many of us choose because we, we like the sound of them or mm -hmm. we like their yeah. poetic qualities, um, but not because they provide these really necessary mm -hmm. insights. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. 